Hey everyone, it's Dr. Sarah here. Welcome back to the She Found Motherhood podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of chatting with Di from Elevate Pilates Physio. And we are taking a very deep dive into a very specific topic. Returning to running after a cesarean birth. Believe it or not, there's a lot that needs to be taken into account when you're returning to running as physical activity after birth, and more specifically after cesarean birth. We'll get into all the details right after this quick message. Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. We are doctors Sarah and Alicia, maternity physicians and moms who have been through it all. We want to empower you with knowledge so you can have the best pregnancy, birth, and postpartum experience you can. She Found Health and She Found Motherhood is meant for general medical information only. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This information does not apply to every situation. If you have questions or if you've received different advice, please contact your healthcare provider. Always seek the advice of your physician or another qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. The views expressed by She Found Found Health and She Found Motherhood and our guests are not representative of any of the institutions with which we are affiliated. Some of our podcast episodes are sponsored so that we can keep getting great info out there to you, our listeners. We only partner with companies that we truly believe in. Some of our links and suggestions may be affiliates, and we would appreciate you using them to help fund this important work. Now let's get to it. Good morning, Di. Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. Morning, Sarah. How are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to see you. Yeah, you too. I wish we lived in the same city. I know. We need to be closer. We need to go trail running together. Exactly. Oh my gosh. And what a great intro into what this podcast is about. So today, Diane and I are going to talk about return to running after cesarean birth. Now, this is a really specific topic, but if you think about the number of people in one in three pregnant people and women will have a cesarean birth and many of us are runners. So I think save this one for those of you who are currently pregnant because... In a few months, it may be you who's wanting to return to running. Exactly. And I said it was on point because I actually have a running injury because I didn't do like proper rehab and I have a high hamstring injury and all sorts of public floor stuff. So it's so important. And I was going to tell you before we were recording and I was like, no, wait, I'll tell this story now because I, my youngest is four, four and a half this month. And I just sold my Thule Urban Glide, which was my jog stroller and I loved it. But he's going to kindergarten. I really need to get rid of it. If it's funny. It can be a bit of a crutch for people. Once you get used to using it, your running stride changes, like your mechanics change. And it's also a great place to carry your water bottle and snacks. Yeah, it can be very convenient, but it can be a bit of a crutch. So okay. yeah, I let it go. I let it go. So maybe we can back it up a little bit and you can just explain to us what like what sort of considerations should be made for someone after they've had a cesarean birth in terms of like return to activity and what's going on with your pelvic floor? Yeah, that's a great place to start. So when you think about any time after any type of birth you and returning to activity, there's a couple kind of basic steps that you want to take. And then if you've had a specifically, if you've had a cesarean birth, you want to think of a couple of different considerations than you might think if you had a vaginal birth or a vaginal assisted birth. So I think the first thing to think about is why do people stop running during pregnancy? So like really back it up. And a lot of people have different reasons, but nausea and sickness is a big one. A lot of people have a lot of fear or nervousness around are they going to do damage to themselves or their baby during pregnancy? And so those psychological aspects can play a huge role when you're postpartum and you're wanting to return to activity. And that's the first step. So recognizing if you had any of those feelings in pregnancy and then addressing them as early as you can, either in pregnancy with the pelvic floor physio who specializes in that in sport, and if not in pregnancy, then postpartum. Yeah, I think we undervalue pelvic floor physiotherapy in pregnancy. It's such a good tool. All the evidence shows that if you're able to do some work in pregnancy, your return to activity and just return to everyday life postpartum is going to be that much easier. So we strongly encourage it. And it's nice to see that the trend is starting to go that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if we think about the steps, if you've had a cesarean, Step one, we always want you to rest. It can't be said enough. We are not rushing you back to activity. Actually, the latest evidence that has come out is that 
those people who are aware of the guidelines of return to running and return to sport postpartum, they actually return to sport later than those who had no education or no awareness, but they do better in the long run. They have less injuries, less complications. Yeah. So surprising. Yeah, not at all. Yeah. And so the first thing we encourage is rest and pain management and a little bit of breathing work. And this is where you guys come in, in terms of the pain management side, helping people if they need to be on any medications, if they need to be icing, things like that. We want to rest, recover, connect with your baby. And really that's the first zero to six weeks. Yeah. And I think that's really important. Six weeks, like you're just starting to think about returning to activity. Like it's not like, boom, six weeks, time to run. Exactly. In six weeks, the strength of the scar is just starting to form. So it really takes that actually six to nine months before that scar is fully the tensile strength or the strength of the scar is back to that kind of 90% to 100% of where you want it to be. So that first six weeks, it's just starting to heal. So rest, pain management, if that means a little bit of icing, doing things like splinting, holding a pillow to your incision, if you're laughing or coughing, really making sure that you aren't getting massive amounts of pain in that area because that can play a role later. So that's step one. And then we want to think about step two, and that's once your incision is healed. And so once you've been cleared by your doctor, if you've had dissolving stitches, if they're totally healed up, you don't have scabs or anything anymore. Then we start to look at things like scar desensitization, which we can touch a bit on, and then a massage and things like scar tape are super helpful. But let's talk a bit about the breathing first. When you think about breathing, our diaphragm is a flat muscle that sits just below our rib cage. And so during pregnancy, obviously that muscle can't expand down as much or wide because you've got a baby pushing up on it. So during pregnancy, people start to breathe up into their shoulders a little bit more. They get shallower breaths and might get out of breath easier. And that's a lot of times because they're not getting those deep, full breaths like you usually could before pregnancy or during postpartum. And so part of the breathing is just to start to expand that diaphragm again, get yourself breathing into your belly again. And then there's a huge connection between your pelvic floor and your diaphragm. And they should work like a piston where they should, the diaphragm's at the top, the pelvic floor is at the bottom. When you breathe in, they both drop down or expand. And when you breathe out, they should draw up and together. I'm doing it right now. Yeah, perfect. I can see it. I can see the focus on your face. <laughs> um, yeah, interesting. And so that the quickest way, we use it in clinic for people of all ages, like you could be 65 coming into the clinic. And the first thing we check before we do anything else is we usually check your breathing. And we might be doing this without you really realizing, and then we might be getting you to do some deep breaths. But if you can pay attention to breathing into your belly and really letting your diaphragm and rib cage expand, it's a really great way to start to connect with your pelvic floor without you having to consciously think about it. So that's our number one breathing thing is just to get some of those deep belly breaths going. And then if we think about scar desensitization, so a lot of people are really uncomfortable with their scars. And this is something you can do with scars all over your body. So it can be from anything. So a little story I told on social media recently was that I haven't had children. So I haven't had a cesarean birth at all, but I have had oh, an open abdo like abdominal surgery from a hernia. And it was very small compared to cesarean scar, but I had to do so much work on desensitization, scar massage. I used some scar tape and it's, it took a lot of effort and a lot of work, but now it's in a place where I don't, I wouldn't even remember that it was there. So the first thing is the scar desensitization. So it can feel really numb around the scar for a lot of people. Yeah, people complain about that a lot. Yeah, and that's because the nerves get, get injured or damaged during the incision, which is very normal. So it's nothing yeah. to be worried about. It's so funny when we think about the term injury in birth, people get all concerned, but people come into my clinic with a sprained ankle and we call that an injury. And so it's not, it doesn't need to be a massive thing. It's just another type of injury. So injury is just a word, Yeah, but it is an injury and nerves are the slowest thing to regenerate and heal. They're so slow. It's like a millimeter a day or something. A millimeter a day. Yeah. Yeah. 
So if we can do something to encourage them to regenerate a little bit faster, we would love to do that. So usually start people with taking things like a feather, a washcloth. I actually really like people to, to use a spoon, the back of a spoon, because oh, it's yeah. like a cold temperature. If you use it on your under eyes, you can also use it on your scar. And it will also help with temperature and then smoothness. So you just rub all of those items along the area about an inch above and below the scar. And you're just trying to do it while you do some of your breathing at the same time. And just introducing the scar to different feelings. So this is perfect if you're someone who's maybe you're not wearing jeans yet postpartum for so many reasons, but because your scar bothers you or you're not wearing leggings that rub your scar, this is something I would really focus and then scar tape is also great. There's a couple different brands out there. You can get them on Amazon. You can get them on the, most of the drugstores have them, but they have some vitamin E in them as well as they help just protect the scar and they help smooth it out. So if you're getting like a bit of a lump or a keloid on your scar, scar tape helps really well. Silicone scar tape, or you can use paper tape. Okay. So either or, because I've heard of the silicone strips. So yeah. I personally like the silicone. I think they just feel a bit more comfortable, but some people like the paper tape and it's, it can go both ways. We'll link to some of those in the show notes for people. Yeah, perfect. Wondering. Yeah, maybe you can yeah. send me some. That yeah, for sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and it's also, it's never too late to use those. Oh, so, no. Yeah, so if you're, you might not get as great or as quick a result, but it's never too late to use them. Okay, so breathing exercises, Scar desensitization and scar tape are the first step. And scar massage. Okay, do you want to talk yeah. about that a bit? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So scar massage, basically you're going to move the scar in every different direction. So if it, your scar is starting to feel sticky or like it's catching or kind of stuck when you move certain directions, then scar massage is what you want to do. And I'm going to show you on my hand, but basically you're taking flat fingers, the pads of your fingers, not the pokey bits. And you're rubbing in circles counterclockwise for a minute. And you're just going a little bit above, a little bit of below. And if you feel comfortable right on the scar, you're going to go one direction for a minute, the other direction for a minute. You're going to do this up down motion. And then you're going to do side to side. You can start to actually pick up the skin, but that's a bit more of an advanced technique. If that's not comfortable yet, you're just trying to move the tissue in every different direction. Just because when tissue heals, it can, it's like a web and the web can start to get a little bit sticky. And we, if we're moving the tissue in the way that we want the tissue to move when it's fully healed, it's going to heal better. That totally makes sense. So you can yeah. do a reel. Everyone go follow Di on Instagram. <laughs> do a reel about scar massage, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. It'll be out today. Okay. So breathing, desensitization, strips, and scar massage. Exactly. Then you're looking at the psychological aspect. If you are noticing that this is making you really uncomfortable, if when you think about running, maybe your heart starts to race or you notice you're avoiding it, that's when we refer to mental health. And there are some great counselors that are all doing virtual work as well as in person now. So highly recommend looking at that and speaking to your doctor if you need to, but looking at some sort of counseling help. Yeah, it's so important. And I think it's something that we shouldn't just brush off. Oh, you'll, it'll pass because it probably won't. And it's so important as mothers to also remember to honor who we were before we became mothers, like to be the runner that you were, to be that whatever dancer, whatever. It's so important. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah. And then also finding something that you like to do. So this is about running. Yeah. But if you don't like running, oh God, don't run. No, no. Do something you love to do, no. especially when you have kids and you have limited, very limited amounts of time. We are huge advocates of finding something. We, we want everyone to be active, but that doesn't need to be in a gym. It doesn't need to be a spin class. It can be, it can look different for everybody. So just something that I like to remind people of. If it's not bringing you joy, it, find something else. Agree. 1000%. <laughs> and then there's actually been some really great studies that have come out on this as well in looking at people who ran and found joy from running before pregnancy. 
when they return to running, even if they're running slower, they're doing less races or they're doing shorter distances, their amount of joy that they got out of doing the activity of running was just as high as pre-pregnancy. Totally. I think of myself like I ran too soon, so don't do what I did. I did some trail races after all my kids and I don't even remember how fast or how slow I went, but like just to be moving my body and to be by myself in the woods and then my kids are there at the end eating all the snacks. Yeah. They're some of the best memories I have from an like early postpartum. Yeah. And we'll get into that. I don't know if you, did you trail run before? Yes. Yeah, I did. Okay. But not we'll as talk- much, but not as much as I did after. Yeah. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because moving from a lot of people start off road running and then move into trail running postpartum and they there's a lot yeah there's a lot of different reasons for it but it's a really interesting transition that people find really helpful for there's a lot of things from a physio standpoint that we can see but then from a psychological standpoint as well yeah so you want to think about those psychological things when you're returning to running then you want to think about involving a little bit more pelvic floor some abdominal and core exercises body weight exercises, specifically focusing on the hip musculature and strengthening your core, your low back and pelvis. So that's where the majority of running injuries that we see postpartum are. I'm laughing because like literally die before this podcast <laughs> doing like bridges, clamshells, like I was doing my physio exercise. I love it. You're like the perfect person. Wow. Six years later, four years later. Because it's never too late to start. Please, folks, please listen to what Di is saying. And I like have an injury that's almost two years old, my high hamstring, and it's just so slow to heal. Yeah, it can take a really long time. So once you once we get into this area, this is where pelvic floor physio is so important. So having someone to do a pelvic floor assessment, and a lot of people don't know what that is. They come into our clinic and they've even booked the appointment and they don't know what it is. So it doesn't involve any instruments. We do usually like to do a vaginal exam if the patient's comfortable with it. You don't have to. And we do it laying down to start. This usually wouldn't be on your first appointment. But one of the things that we get you to do later when you're closer to returning to running an activity is we actually do an internal pelvic floor assessment when you're standing. Because you run standing. Exactly. Exactly. So we might do things like get you to stand on one leg, do some squats, and we'll be feeling internally to see what's happening. So we're looking for things like, is there a prolapse? Is there a descent coming down? And this might have been something you've reported to us, or you might not be feeling any symptoms. So it's something we can check for. Are you getting any leaking? Are you able to hold a pelvic floor contraction while you're doing different movements? Uh, looking at what happens when you cough or when you lift things, how does that change what's going on with your pelvic floor? Basically, what we want to think about with your pelvic floor is it's like a basket at the bottom of your abdominal cavity, and it should be holding everything up. And it doesn't need to be clenched all the time. It needs to actually relax just as much as it needs to clench. And that's what makes a really strong pelvic floor. But we want to look at things like coordination. So do your muscles work together really well? Is the timing of their contraction really good? Do you have to think about it or not think about it? So there's all these little things that we can play with you in clinic. And this is where it becomes really specific person to person. And we might be getting you to do a whole bunch of little quick contractions. We might be asking you to do maybe a longer hold, but not at a full contraction. We might be getting you to just work on relaxing your pelvic floor, or we might be asking you to do more things where you're doing a really strong pelvic floor contraction, but at a specific time in a movement. Yeah. So yeah. it's really specific person to person at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Does that help? It does. Your- and I think it's such an important message like that your pelvic floor needs to also relax. Yeah. We... And it's funny because people think, especially if they've had a cesarean birth, there was no like pelvic floor trauma, but oftentimes people are like hyper, what's the word I'm looking for? Tonic. They're hypertonic. Right? Hypertonic. Like your pelvic floor is so contracted. And that was one of the first things I've done some pelvic floor physio. They're like, teach you how to actually relax your pelvic floor. Yeah. And it's so interesting with runners because when we see runners clinically, a lot of times their dysfunction pre-pregnancy is because their pelvic floor is holding on for dear life. It's really tight. And that's because it's withstanding a lot of pressure coming down all the time. And so it's learned to do that. But we actually want to teach it how to relax and then contract. And it's going to be stronger for it. 
Yeah. So I get people to do this. Imagine holding your fist in a really tight fist. If you are squeezing as tight as you can, okay, hold it for a few seconds. And then imagine someone really quickly throws an egg at your head and you had to catch it. Your hand kind of cramps and you can't respond as quickly. Whereas if your hand is in this ready position or kind of a soft, relaxed position, if someone were to throw something at you, you could catch it. Mm -hmm. And that's your pelvic floor. If it's holding on tight all day and then we load it like we cough or we sneeze or we laugh or we run, it's not going to be able to respond appropriately. Mm, That makes so much sense. It's a very good visual. Thank you. I I find that when throwing, getting an egg thrown into your head, you're like, you want to respond quickly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is this pain I'm feeling in my pelvis normal? Should I do genetic testing for chromosomal differences in my baby? Is it safe to go to the dentist while I'm pregnant? Doctors and maternity specialists Sarah and Alicia are here to empower you with even more knowledge so you can have the best pregnancy, birth, and postpartum experience you can. Presenting the Pregnancy to Parenthood podcast, a new series of informative episodes geared week by week toward whatever trimester of pregnancy you're in. Tune in weekly, following along relevant topics as you move through pregnancy, or just binge listen and come back to the episodes you found most helpful. Access the full series for a full two years and listen to it on your own time. To learn more, go to www.shefoundhealth.ca or click the link below. So that that taking up the first little bit of time and really all the evidence is showing that we don't want anyone running before three months. Do you hear that, everybody? I know. It's not what people want to hear. No, it's not. And I'm a runner. I don't want to hear this either. But really, it's what we should be telling everybody and what we really hope for everyone to do. And that doesn't mean you can't be active. You can walk. You can do other activities, but running specifically. Yeah. And I think it's really important when we're talking about the pelvic floor is and we're talking about cesarean births, is that people forget that just because you didn't have a vaginal birth doesn't mean that your pelvic floor isn't affected. So you may have gone through pushing before your cesarean, right? Yeah. This is where you are the expert here, but so there may have been an attempt to a vaginal birth. You may have had a planned cesarean, but you still have had a baby sitting on your pelvic floor for up to nine months or a little more. Exactly. I know. And I don't think people... You have to remember that is like a stress on your pelvic floor in and of itself. Just being pregnant. Yes, not just the vaginal birth. That exactly the trauma or the injury. Exactly. So in that zero to three months time, once you've gotten clearance from your doctor, once your pelvic floor physio is starting to guide you on what to do, we generally say at least six weeks of hip and like lumbo pelvic, which is core lower body strengthening exercises. So that's things like you said. So clamshells, bridges, single leg bridges, squats, single leg squats. Then you might get into doing things like jumping on one leg, running in place. And then to give people clearance, we actually have some guidelines on what we look for to give people clearance at that three month mark. So say you haven't seen anybody and you've been doing things on your own, you come into the clinic, it's about three months. They're like, Hey, I want to start returning to running. What can I do? And then we've got a list of things we want to look for. So with the things we want to look for first, we want to check and see if you have any heaviness, any dragging kind of pelvic discomfort or vaginal discomfort, any uncontrolled bleeding. So not menstrual bleeding, but if you're coming into us and you've got bleeding, we send you back to people like you. That's not something that a pelvic floor physio will look at. We'll send you right back to your specialist. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. If you're getting urinary incontinence, so if you're getting leaking pee or urgency that's really uncontrolled with fecal or urine, we want to look at that first. And then there's things that you can, we can be doing some of this work as you're starting to run, but it's things that we do want to really work on. So if you're having any of these things, if you're having pain with intercourse, if you're noticing abdominal doming or incision pain, those are things we really want to see you in the clinic for before we say, okay, yes, you can start running. Yeah, I know it's so important and it might sound like a bummer to hear that, right? For people who are- yeah running it's so worth it and like you reflected back at the beginning saying that study that showed people who returned to running later had less injury and like speaking from someone who has had to 
I've not been able to run almost since last summer. Like it's really significant. Yeah. And it can take a huge toll on your mental health as well. We want to give people lots of avenues to be active, but returning to run, we want it to be about from three months onwards, three months is the bare minimum. And then we want to check all these things. So let's talk about a couple of things that we will check functionally. Yes. So once you've cleared, you don't have any of those concerns we talked about just a minute ago about the heaviness or the massive incision pain. Then if we see you in the clinic, we look and check 10 fast contractions of your pelvic floor. Make sure that you can do those. So that's a really quick contract, relax, contract, relax. Yep. Then we want to think about 8 to 12 reps of 6 to 8 second maximal voluntary contractions. So that's when your pelvic floor is squeezing as hard as you can. And we're making sure that you're lifting up and pulling in and not pushing down. Mm -hmm because that's a huge one. And we want you to be able to hold it for about six to eight seconds. So that's what we've all agreed upon in the community. Yes. And then we also are looking at about 60 seconds. So a minute hold of a 30 to 50% contraction. Okay. So that's a submaximal contraction. And that's actually for running, I think really important because we don't want you in what we talked about earlier, that like really hypertonic held tense through your pelvic floor state. We want things to be on but just enough yeah yeah oh interesting kind so, of complicated. yeah I know it is complicated so having a pelvic floor physio will make it easier if you're yeah. able to access one if you are looking for one there's lots of resources you can connect with me and I can connect you with one in in your local area especially if you're in Canada we have an amazing network across the country and so um, we can always help people find their pelvic floor physio. Yeah, and there's lot, lots of extended benefits covering. Yes. Unfortunately, yeah. not MSP covered yet. And then if you have a, if you're in the low income category, there is some MSP coverage for physio. It's yeah, and it varies from clinic to clinic, but there is coverage. There's also sometimes even having a group session. A lot of pelvic floor physios will hold a group session. I hold a group prenatal class. I'm planning on doing a group postpartum class in the fall. Oh, wow. And having that group class cuts the cost down, you still get a ton of education and yeah. we usually mix like workouts plus education. And virtual too is a great option for people who live in more yeah. communities. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We haven't got to it yet, but the functional exercises. Oh yeah. Let's, our, let's... our checklist. So we want you to be able to walk for 30 minutes. Okay. That can be with or without a stroller, but at a, like a... I'm going through all this in my head to see if I can run again. Okay, so can you walk for 30 minutes? Yes. Okay, can you balance on one leg for 10 seconds? Yeah, I think so. I'm going to try. Okay. okay, then we look at doing a single leg squat 10 times per side. No, that, that is my weakness. The single leg squats, right? I know, but yeah. single leg activity. Yeah, exactly. Running is a single leg activity. Yeah. So a lot of these things, people think they're ready to run and then they try them and they <laughs> said, it's a rude awakening. Yeah. We want you to be able to jog on the spot for one minute. Yeah. Definitely. And then we look at forward bounds. So that's a two-footed, like a standing long jump. We want to check for 10 of those. Wow. So when you, let's go back to those squats. That yeah. Kind of, dude, how deep are we talking? So, I mean, personally, I can't even go that deep because I have not great ankle. Yeah. Dorsiflexion. Yeah. So we're not expecting you to go down into a full pistol squat or anything. Yeah. We're thinking like 45 to 60 degrees depth. Okay. So could you like so, single leg squat as if you're going to sit in a chair and then back up? Yeah, that's actually one of the more advanced exercises we'll get to. Uh, yeah. Okay. So maybe I'm not as hopeful. You might not be as far off as you think. Okay. But that's a really good one. All of these are looking also at lumbopelvic strength and their core coordination as well. So they're kind of including everything as well as balance. So we also want to make sure that you can hop in place for 10 repetitions on one leg. And then, yeah. And then there's something called the running man, which we ask you to do 10 on each side. And well, that's the dance move. Yeah, it's a dance move. It's the bent knee, drive the other knee up. It basically imagine starting off the starting blocks. Yeah. Okay. As a sprinter. Yeah. but not all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. So 10 of those on each leg. Once you can do that, then we also look at 20 repetitions of a single leg calf raise. Right. Yep. A sing 20 repetitions of a single leg bridge. 
which yeah. is a lot harder than you think. That is so hard. I can do yeah. I'm working on those because I could barely do them when I started. It's my right side that's weak. Everyone's getting an intimate look at my <laughs> floor and postpartum issues. I can do like maybe eight. Yeah. On my bad side. It's crazy. Yeah. And so that one's always 20, a tricky one. 20? 20. 20. Okay. Yeah. Got some work to do, Sarah. And then we'd also look at 20 single leg sit to stand. Okay. So that's on a chair. So be careful on the depth of your chair. I had a client, I was actually at her house this morning doing an in-home visit and we were doing this and she didn't have a chair that was high enough. So it was really low. So it was past that 90 degree mark. If you're looking oh, at the chair, that's it, very low. Yeah. I was like, this is, we're not going to count this because it's too low. So you want to be about 90 degrees or a bit above. Okay. In a typical sitting chair, like you would have at a kitchen table. Yeah. Okay. So 20 of those single leg. And then the last one is single leg abduction, which means you're lying on your side and you're lifting your top leg up in line with your hip and back down 20 times. Okay. I can do that. No problem. Yeah. So most people find that the single leg sit to stand and the single leg bridge are the two ones that they have. And actually the balance, those are the three that people have the hardest time with. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I have some work to do. But that's okay. It's just about yeah. recognizing which areas yeah. you want to focus on. So that's the whole point of doing these return to run screens is we're not going to ask you usually to do all of these exercises as homework, but yeah. we might give you two or three. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So once you're cleared, I know there's so many steps, but this is step six. So important. It's so I know. Important. So once you're cleared, then we want to do a return to run program. So that means usually a walk run. And we increase your loading by 10% a week. So 10% is the magic number. And that is the number that you're not going to most likely not going to get injured by increasing. So if we increase more than that, your body is very aware of that. And we'll start to do things to compensate usually. But if you just increase by 10%, you're tricking your body into increasing your load without risking injury. So using a return to run program, thinking about the time of the day and the amount of sleep you got. So if you have on your schedule that you want to run on Wednesday and you, your baby was up all night Tuesday and you haven't slept, your risk of injury goes up yeah. greatly because you're exhausted. Yeah. So maybe you push it to the next day. So thinking about sleep. Yeah. yeah. Which is so Giving cool. yourself some grace. Yes. Yes, exactly. And then we also want you to use the return to run program because if you're someone who is very motivated and we just let you go, a lot of times you'll do too much too soon, we yeah. find. And then you can work with your run coach or your physio to think about distance or time. So personally, I like to, when I do a return to run program, I've had some injuries where I've had to do that. And I know how hard they are because I know how hard it is to stop yourself after you might be only out there for six minutes total. And it's so hard to come back in, but it, you'll see the results. It just takes a little bit of time. But I personally like to monitor time. Some people like to do distance. So some people like, what do you I like? I'm like? just because distance, like it's so variable depending on like yeah. the pace that you run at. And so I think time is a bit more of an easy, like definite marker. Yeah, me too. So some people like distance, some people like time. We can use both. We can be flexible just to like we're asking you to be flexible. Yeah. We would like people to use hills if they have them. So if you're in North Vancouver, where I live, this is perfect. If you're in somewhere like Richmond, BC, where it's completely flat, this is going to be harder. But hills are really great. We just have to use them properly. When I had my hernia repair, I went for a run also probably too soon because I didn't know any better. And I found that going uphill was great. I found that going flat was okay. And I found going downhill was so hard because you use your core so much more going downhill. Yeah. And so you want to think about when you return to running, starting on an uphill with your run and then walking back down. So run a minute up the hill walk a minute down the hill. If you don't have a hill, you can do flat and just do run, walk timing that way. But using hills to run up, A, you're going to get stronger because you're going to get your muscles stronger faster. 
because you're doing a little bit of strength work going up the hill. And then the tip of your pelvis is a little bit backwards going up the hill. So if you're getting any urinary incontinence, you're yeah. going to give yourself more support because the back muscles of your pelvic floor, the posterior part, there, there's more muscle bulk there. Um, and your bladder's getting shifted backwards. Yeah. So it's not pushing forwards yet. Um, and then the last thing is because you're going up the hill, gravity is not pulling you down. And so if you have pain along your incision or your abdominals are a little bit weaker, you're not having gravity push your insides out towards those muscles everything is getting pulled back in a little bit yeah that makes so much sense yeah so running up uphill as as much as I hate running uphill it's really the best way to start yeah it's hard yeah really? but think about it then you're gonna feel so fast and strong when you get onto flat ground yeah totally so that's where we'd get people to start you can think about maybe using trails so Hmm. The trails are a really great way to work on a little bit of balance, work on a little, you usually go a little bit slower in the trails just because you have to focus on things like your footwork and not falling over roots and stuff. There's variable. So there's like uphill, downhill, lots of different yeah. spaces. And then you're not, because you're in a trail and you're using different muscles going side to side, up and down, you're working on lots of different little stabilizing muscles in your hip and pelvis. Whereas road running, you use the same muscles more or less, and it can be a bit more repetitive and it can cause a little bit more strain on things like your IT band or your hamstrings. Yeah. Oh man. Where were you like four years ago, Di? Only things to think about. Oh my gosh. I think it's really important to lay it out for people and you're more likely to have success in the long run. Exactly. So what would you say like the average return to running is for people that you typically work with? Three to six months. And that's not bad. Pregnancy is nine months, 10 months. So to get back to running in about a third, two thirds of that time is pretty decent. Yeah. And I think just the thing to remember is if you're not feeling ready at that point, then there's also no rush. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you laid it out for us. So the beginning, like gentle breathing, strips, desensitization, massage, and then moving into a pelvic floor evaluation and assessment. And then specific exercises to work on based on your own limit sort of injury yeah, what, yeah exactly so what we see might be some deficits or areas to work on yeah and then we want you to do some more functional specific exercises so those squats yeah single leg exercises balance exercises maybe and then we move you into the actual return to run program amazing Oh my gosh, it's laid out so clearly now. Now that we've had this conversation, I'm like, that just makes sense. <laughs> I'm glad. I hope so. Yeah, no, it really does. So for so for people who I have a question, people who aren't runners but maybe want to get into running after they have a baby, because it is a very convenient activity, especially if you have a beautiful jog stroller like Truly Urban Glide, which is not hashtag not sponsored, but maybe I'll reach out because I yeah. loved. I had. I probably have had 10 strollers over the course of my three children because you just got yeah. um, and it was definitely my favorite. But would you take, so if somebody hadn't been a runner, but they think they'll want to get into running because it's a great way to get a baby who doesn't want to sleep to sleep is take them for a run or a walk. Would you have any different like approach for them? I would really emphasize the going slow. So instead of that six, six week strengthening, it might be a 12 week strengthening program a little more checking in and then the return to run program is really sticking to that 10% load a week. Yeah. Other than that, there's not a huge difference. It's also about setting goals. So that person might do a, what we call a couch to 5k program, which I think we need to all rebrand, but basically yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. Yeah. a little <laughs> offensive. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they've always been called. And I think we need to rebrand them. I think we can do better. But yeah. that kind of learning to run maybe zero to 5K program yeah. versus someone who's returning to run that wants to run a marathon. Yeah. We're going to give them different load amounts when they return to run and their goals are going to be a little bit different in their targeting. But the first kind of three months of steps is really the same. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great to hear because I think like 
You don't have to be a runner. That's the message at the end of this. Di and I both happen to like running. And if you want to get into running, great. If you want to return to running, great. If you don't, that's okay. And I think this applies to like any activity you want to do, right? If you're a dancer or if you're, I'm trying to think of other tennis player, whatever, just making sure that you have rehabilitated your body in an appropriate fashion. Because first is a musculoskeletal injury. Exactly. Especially if you've had a cesarean section. So yeah, can we just talk really quickly? Because yeah. you know this. Yeah. So in a cesarean section, I think it's always important to, to mention that the muscles aren't actually always cut. Correct. They are not ever really cut. Right. Yeah. So I think people don't realize that. Yeah. So when we're telling you that we want you to rehab your core because you've had a cesarean birth, it's not because your muscles have been cut. No. It's because stretch. exactly it's the stretch and we want everything to come back together after that stretch has happened. And then all of the other tissues need to heal. Yes, exactly. So the only thing that is cut is the skin, the subcutaneous like tissues, the fascia. So the fascia is like the thick connective tissue layer that sort of keeps your skin on the outside and your bits on the inside. Call it the sausage casing. Yeah, that's a great and yeah, a great analogy time. Yeah, all about it. And then we poke a hole into the peritoneum which is like another sausage casing basically and then your muscles are often like there's everyone has a degree of diastasis right the diastasis of separation and so we just separate the muscles further um and then cut into the uterus but that's it right the muscles are already naturally separated to a degree and so they're not cut ever intent yeah yeah and I, i think that a lot of people don't know that so i think that's something just to to remember when you're, if you've had a cesarean or you're planning to have one that we're not saying that you have to rehab differently because your muscles have been cut. It's just that you've had an incision through the other tissues. Yeah, exactly. And it's that fascia, like the uterus, it's crazy, like, cause the uterus contracts down. So we put stitches in the uterus, obviously to repair it and to stop the bleeding. But oh, the OBs, I should know this because I former life, but within a few days, like those sutures are just floppy, right? Because the uterus contracts down so hard. That your uterus, like your uterine incision starts to heal really quickly. It's that fascial layer, that like thick sausage casing that we really don't want to have any damage done to the stitches through that layer. Yeah. And that's often the one that people complain about the most. Like you get pain along the sides where the knots are and that's pretty normal. But I think doing all the like scar rehabilitation stuff that you had recommended is really beneficial. And even if you're not planning to return to any like significant high impact activity, even if you're going to be, if you're a walker or a swimmer, it's still important to do that scar mobility and release and massage and all that. Yeah. In the reel you're now prompting me to do, I will, (laughs) I will also show some work you can, so some people really don't like touching their incision and I get it. And so what you can use is use a Pilates ball. They're like a 10 inch ball. Oh yeah. Everywhere. I'll show you, I'll show it in the reel, but I'll tag you guys, but basically you can do some rolling on that. So imagine if you were foam rolling, like your calves, we're using the ball to very gently start to move the fascia and the tissue along that abdominal wall and abdominal incision. And so that's another way people can do some scar massage if they get a bit squeamish about their scar touching it. Oh, that's your good tip. Look at this. You're going to have so much content. I know. You're putting me to work. Okay. Amazing. So anything else? We talked about the road to recovery for running or other high impact activities. Anything else you wanted to touch on that we didn't talk about? Well, not really a pelvic floor thing, but I think really important when you're talking about return to running is, so did you change any of your sports bras? Oh, yeah. 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 So I think people forget that they might need to go out and find some new, more supportive maybe breastfeeding friendly sports bras that are going to give you a little bit more support. And the last thing you want to do is go out on your run and feel like you're held in. So yeah, I would run with two. I've been through many different sports bras that have you heard of the Tata Tamer from? Yes. The like, Lily Lemon one. I would run with two Tata Tamers on. And then I found a brand like a breastfeeding friendly that had Velcro. So you could just like Velcro the, oh, the that's top perfect. with a strap attached to the bra. So if I can find that, I'll the brand name I'll post in the show notes. I got it at one of our local running stores here, Front Runners. Oh, uh, they're great. Yeah. And now I have one of the NYX bros. It's like, yeah. I don't know. Anyways, but yeah, it's a really good point. Your breasts change significantly and you're going to want to feel supported, especially if you're breastfeeding, right? 
Yeah. So I think just the equipment, make sure you've got the right equipment. If your feet have changed sizes, like you might need to be going and getting fitted for some new running shoes. Yeah. If you're getting foot pain, please see a physio as well. Plantar fasciitis, which is pain along the arch of the foot, especially after standing up after you've been sitting for a long time or getting out of bed, that can be made worse if you start running. So address that before you start running. You might need to get some orthotics temporarily. So those are things to think about before you start running. And then really quickly, last thing is touching on stroller running. Yeah. So if you are going to run with a stroller, start with a two-hand technique. So both fingertips on the stroller. Then you can start to play around with a one-hand technique, a push technique. There's lots of different things that you can try, but start with a two-handed method. It just puts your body in the most symmetry, which is what we want to start with. And it gives you a little bit more support and then make sure that the, you aren't running. So how, when did you start running with your kids in the stroller? Four months, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, So you want to make sure their head and neck controls good enough to hold on to it. That's the other thing is it's usually between four and eight months that we recommend people starting, but it's when your child has enough head and neck control that you're not going to put them at risk, putting them in a stroller. So people sometimes think, I think that you can just start running with your baby in a stroller right away and unfortunately yeah yeah, you're shaking your head not the case (laughs) no don't do that although you know what it's a really nice option is like I am a stroller connoisseur everybody you name it I've probably had it because I have a bunch of stroller strollers at my parents place too that like people over there like on the mainland gave me yeah Uh, but the the chariot which I think now is Thule chariot brand they have an infant sling for their for the insert right yeah. And yeah. those are great. And those are a lot of options. And again, Di said you have to wait for head and neck control, but there's just, they're just things that you can get your baby into. So maybe you have a stroller that you want to use for running. So you don't have to buy two strollers, but you can put an insert in while they're a little infant. Anyways, folks come at me with all your stroller questions. I've had them all. Perfect. Oh my gosh. Amazing Di. I have one final question for you. I'm asking for a friend. I'm asking for me. Do you do virtual stuff? I do. So I do virtual appointments i do in-home pr- appointments on the north shore of Wait, from victoria <laughs> it's from victoria but i could do a virtual yeah and then we've got a great network so if you're somewhere else and you really want someone in person we've got really great physios throughout the country of canada and we've got a good network in the states as well but especially canada we've got people everywhere okay awesome so i will People will tag your Instagram and you put your website in the show notes so people will know how to get a hold of you. And I'm just so grateful for this conversation. I'm, I learned so much doing these podcasts. Thanks so much for having me. That was really fun. It was super fun. Okay. Have a good day. Thanks. You too. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca and to sign up for our community for weekly bump blasts. Make sure to check us out on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood and head on over to your favorite podcast app and leave a review and a five-star rating. If you enjoyed this podcast, take a pic of yourself listening to it and share it on social. Make sure to tag us on it so we know to keep making them.